friends, we will now continue in our scripture reading and also in our, in our sermon. Uh, our scripture reading today will be taken from Job chapter 1, verse 13 to 22. This is the word of God. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon them, the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Thus says the Lord. Let's pray together as we continue in our series through the book of Job. Father, we pray that as we open up this particular section of your word, you would help us think about it critically. You would help us Um, receive it with our hearts and that you'd also let that then affect our emotions and our actions and our and our wholeness help us now embrace your word and help us now to be affected by it in your son's name we pray amen so friends we are continuing in our series to the book of job and as we saw last week the main point The main question that the book of Job addresses is how are we supposed to think and how are we supposed to make sense of times of suffering, especially the times of sufferings that kind of seem random, like the one we're in right now. You know, if if a bad guy or if a corrupt politician or if a corrupt businessman or if a thief gets caught in the act and if a bad person, you know, gets caught in the act and if bad things happen to them, not many people will will bat an eye. They won't really think much of it. They'll say, well, that's well-deserved. It's their own fault. But what about when good people suffer? People like Job, who we saw in the first 12 verses of the book last week, was described as a good man. How do you make sense of his suffering? See, life and suffering right now seem to have no rhythm to it. It just happens to good and to bad people alike. It's, It's an utter mess. Now, the book of Job affirms, and at the end makes sense uh, of all this by saying that everything will be in its place at the end, and God will make every wrong right. But until then, it does also say it's going to be an utter mess. As far as who receives pain and who receives blessing and who gets uh, joy and who gets justice and who doesn't, it's going to be a mess. And so... How are we supposed to deal with this mess right now? And how are we supposed to respond when when calamity hits us? Well, that's what our passage today is specifically about. The passage I just read, Job chapter 1, verses 13 and 22, portrays Job as the ideal sufferer. In verse 22, he responds to all of his sufferings without sinning, it says. Now, how does he remain in this perfect posture He doesn't, by the way, remain in this perfect posture in chapter 3 onwards, but now, up to chapter 2, he does. He, our book says, suffered well. And look, if there's ever a time where we as a church, we as a human race, need an example of how to suffer well, isn't it now? So let's dive in. What can we learn from Job here and how he handled the pain he was in? Well, there's three things that he knew. Job knew that his suffering was controlled by God. Job knew that his whole person must go to God. And Job knew that God loved him more than he loved himself. Let me repeat that. 
Job knew his suffering was controlled by God. He knew his whole person must go to God, and he knew that God loved him more than he loved himself. First point, his suffering was controlled by God. Now, I admit, this is a truth that is really, really hard to accept. And even our passage, in the way it's written, kind of indicates that accepting this truth that our, our suffering is controlled by God is not a straightforward process. Look at some of the things that our author did in this passage. Uh, in, by the way, he writes it to communicate uh, the hardness of, of accepting this truth. First, he applied abrupt scene cuts between this scene and the previous scenes. Okay, remember last week's sermon, uh, uh, rewind to chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. If you recall, the scenes change from heaven and earth pretty abruptly. Right? Job chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, the setting was strictly on earth. It was about Job's life. It was about the number of his livestock. It was about the number of his children and about the number of his servants. It was no mention of God, no mention of heavenly things. The scene of verses 1 to 5 was strictly on earth. But then you go to verses 6 to 12, the scene abruptly cuts from earth and was strictly set on heaven. In that scene, you see God and angels and the Satan, Right? And we get a peek there of what's happening behind the screens of Job's suffering. But now in our passage today, we're strictly trans- transported back to earth. In verses 13 to 22, what I just read, we're totally cut away from heaven. We're back on earth. And there's no mention of our passage of God, of Satan, of heaven, of, of angels, nothing. And in a way, our author is trying to tell us here that Heaven and earth in his scenes never meet. They're strictly separated, and Job has no clue as of why all this is happening. And have you ever been in such a state where you feel like you just couldn't see the reasoning behind the curtains for your sufferings? You know, then perhaps you'd experience a tiny bit of relief and some kind of closure If you can just see what's behind the curtains, but yet no matter how many times you pray and look up to the heavens, it seems to be strictly closed off. You get no answer back, just loud silence. And you think, okay, God, take my possessions, take my joy. You know, that's not great, but give me the silent treatment afterwards, leaving me to forever wonder why. You really think it's okay to do that? (laughs) And we start to wonder in these moments, do we not? Is anyone even up there? Is there a purpose to my pain or is it all just random chance? It's hard to accept the truth that suffering is controlled by God when heaven seems to be closed off and is silent. The second thing the author does um, is put into words what I think we all feel in regards to God being in control in our times of suffering. When we hear that truth, I think what we all feel is some kind of reasonable doubt to it. What, what do I mean? Look at the first calamity in verse 13 to 14. Now there is a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in, in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants. Now, we don't quite know the specific location of where Job lived, but the setting here is, is somewhere in the settlements of the ancient Near East. And the, the Sabaeans, they're known to have lived far south region of the ancient Near East. Here's where plausible doubt arises. Because although the Sabaeans do sometimes raid like this, they yet at the same time live quite far down south in the ancient Near East, away from where generally settlements would be. And, and here lies a plausible doubt. Because in one hand, you can, I guess, kind of explain this away, just saying it's coincidence. It just kind of happened because the Sabians are known to do this kind of thing. But on the other hand, it, it doesn't make sense because of where the Sabians lived. They were not near any settlements. And it kind of doesn't make sense that they just happened to be in the area to raid. Do you see the tension there? The author is trying to highlight. You can kind of go both ways. Was this random chance? Or was someone orchestrating all of this? Same with calamity uh, number two in verse 16. A fire from God fell from heaven, burned up all the sheep and all the servants. A fire fell from God. That, that's not some magical fireball that came down from the sky. Back then, that's the normal way to describe thunder. 
What happened here was a huge thunderstorm hit Job's farm. And now again, large thunderstorms like this happened in the ancient Near East region, but it usually happens far west in the region near the coast, not inland where the settlements are, where people lived. So again, you can kind of go both ways here. Was this natural chance? Because this kind of stuff does happen in that region. But also, it's kind of unlikely that it happened this far inland in the settlement. And, and plus, look how big it was. It killed hundreds of sheep. That had to be some big storm. You see, so it was this natural, random chance, or was there some kind of intentionality behind it? Feels like I can go either way. Same with the third calamity in verse 17. Another group of people raided Job, the Chaldeans, killed all his servants, took all his uh, uh, livestock away. By the way, this is not the same Chaldeans that you find in the book of Daniel and in other parts of the Bible. These are the Chaldeans that lived way before that, just happened to have the same name. Okay? Now, now these Chaldeans, same as the Sabaeans, they're nomads. So I guess they could have raided. But again, they're not known to live close to any of the settlements. This time, they live actually far north in the ancient Near East. So it's very unlikely that they would travel all the way in the settlement area and raid it just because it happened to be in the area. And actually, there's no other historical record that shows these Chaldeans ever raided anyone else except for in this book. So again here, you see with the Chaldeans, possible doubt arises. Was this by chance? Because they could have done it. They did exist. They were nomads. They do maybe do this kind of stuff. But it's also very unlikely just kind of naturally happened because the geographical distance. So was someone behind it, controlling it. Last calamity. Verses 18 to 19. A great wind blew the house that Job's children were all in, and they all died. This great wind was a huge desert storm, which, again, did happen a lot back then. So, one more time, it could have been random natural occurrence, but this kind of desert storm would only happen in the deserts at the far east or the, uh, of, of the ancient Near East region where no one lived. It doesn't really happen in the settlement areas, and even if people in the settlement areas felt a bit of the wind, it wouldn't be this big to where it would blow a whole house down. You see how I can go both ways as well? I guess you can say it's natural chance because it, it does happen there, but it feels unlikely that it happened in the way it did. Plausible doubt. Do we not find ourselves feeling the tension that the author is bringing up here in our times of suffering through the way he wrote these events? It can, we can say, I guess, just happen to be random occurrences in nature. Or is it God? You know, but he's giving me the silent treatment. So I don't, I don't know. It's hard to know. But if you look closely, the author does continue and, and settle this tension that despite of heaven's silence and despite of the plausible doubts we may have, all of this, in fact, did come from God. In Hebrew, there's one word that's repeated throughout all of the four calamities we see here, and that is the word fall. We see that in verse 15, the Sabaeans fell upon them. In verse 16, the fire of God, or thunder, fell from heaven. Verse 17, the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels. The, the root word raid for raid there in the Hebrew is the same root word as fell. They fell upon the camels. And in verse 18, a great wind struck four corners of the house and it fell upon the young people. And repetitions like that is not a coincidence, especially in wisdom literature like, like Job. The imagery here is, is someone from above dropping these calamities upon Job. It's natural, yes, but it's also intentional. What's our book trying to tell us here? It's saying when God is silent and when it seems like natural occurrences is just happening, it's hard to accept the truth that this is all from God. But if we want to suffer well, if we want to know how to go through this season well, the Bible says, we have to accept the reality that it is from him that there is some kind of divine hand behind all of it, no matter how silent God may be and no matter how uh, natural of an events these are. And now, okay, we might say, that's fine. For the smaller kind of calamities, I guess I can accept that it's from God. 
But it's kind of hard to believe that this kind of calamity, right, the big ones, is from God. But look at Job's suffering. He was attacked by the Sibians that lived in the south, by the thunderstorm that originated from the west, by the Chaldeans that lived in the north, and by the desert storm that came from the east. The whole world seemed to be against Job. This is a big calamity he's facing. You ever felt like that? Yet, even this one, the author says, it came from God. Now, I admit, accepting that God is behind all this has its complications, okay? Because it brings up all kinds of questions, you know, like why or how could he do this or how is this even fair or doesn't this make God evil? It, It brings up a lot of complications. And because of these complications, people usually avoid accepting this view and instead land on two other popular views. One is just God doesn't exist. Look at all the suffering. God God doesn't exist. Evil is just random. Or two, God does exist, but he is totally random. (laughs) But let me offer you that these two views also has problems of its own. First, if God doesn't exist, let's talk about that view. If there's no creator, there's no purpose, we're all just here randomly by chance. Evil is just some random occurring of nature. The problem there is that we can't truly call evil, therefore, evil. Because if there's no such thing as God, if we all just exist, right? We're here because a strong ate out the weak, and what happens just happens by chance. There's not morally good or bad. It just happens. If that's the case, when the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans raided Job, you can't really call that evil. It just is. Do you know how how chaotic the world would be in this view? Imagine how chaotic the justice system would be based on this view. The strong just ate the weak. It's, It's just an event. You have no basis really to be angry or sad or upset because it's not morally wrong. It just is. See, in this view, you may be sad, but your sadness, it says, it's kind of baseless because that wasn't an evil event It was just an event. Now, is that how we truly feel about the evil and injustices that occurred in our lives or in the lives of our loved ones? It's just an event, tough luck. See, this view, in other words, give no permission for your tears. Now, how about the God exists, but he's totally random view? Well, that has its problems too. Look, if God does exist, but he's random, right? He changes on a whim. He does whatever he wants here and then contradicts himself there. He could love you today and then hate you tomorrow. Sometimes he's fair, sometimes he's unfair, and his character just kind of changes randomly. If, If that's the case, then every single person should be in utter anxiety and despair at all times because you just don't know what's gonna happen. And the concept of justice in this view will always remain a possibility but never a sure end. Sometimes it's real, sometimes it's not, depending on how God feels. There's no hope. See, if the God doesn't exist view gives no permission for your tears, the God is random view gives no permission for your hope. One turns you into a stoical robot, and the other turns you into an anxious mess. But what we see here in Job is that there exists a graceful mixture of both which is our second point. Job's whole person went to God. Look at how Job suffered. Was he sad, angry? Absolutely. Look at verse 20. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. He was devastated. But, but, in his sadness, He wasn't utterly consumed. He wasn't utterly left into total anxiety and despair. There was still a sense of control about him, even in his deepest pains. Look at the beginning of verse 20. After he heard all these calamities, then Job arose. Here's a picture from verses 14 to 19. One news of calamity over the other hit Job back to back to back to back. 
And before one servant finished talking, the other servant came and butted. And before he was finished talking, another servant came. And throughout this whole sequence, Job did not rise up once. He was depicted as sitting down in a chair, remaining in the customary posture of how hosts would welcome guests back then. There was still a sense of control about him, you see. But, but then, after the last news hit, then he rose up. Then the emotions came about. He tore his robe. He shaved his head. Then he expressed overwhelming grief. But then after that grief and sadness, he, he fell to the ground. Now, he didn't fall to the ground because he was wildly just consumed by grief and just lost it. No, this descent to the ground was calculated and purposeful. Why did he fall to the ground? To worship. Do you see the graceful mixture here? of both sadness and sobriety, of losing, losing oneself, yet also still having some sense of control, of wild grief, and yet hints of sensibility still about him. <laughs> what produced this graceful mixture is the realization that God is in control. See, if we believe that God exists, and therefore an objective standard of good and moral, uh, moral righteousness and its opposite, evil, if these concepts are, are real, is, if evil is real, then Job should shed tears over evil. It is right and sad, and sad uh, in the fact that evil occurs. It is good to be angry about evil because it's not good. But yet, Job also at the same time knew God isn't random that he is good and remains good. And therefore, it makes sense for him not only to cry, but also to hope. Do you see the God in control view? Gives permissions for your tears and gives permission for you to hope all at the same time. It produces the graceful mixture of both sadness and sobriety, grief and sensibility, pain and hope. And that's what we see in Job. All of him went to God. His tears, his hope, his sadness, his praise, his lament, his worship, all of him went to, go, to, to, to God because his worldview permits and gives him a foundation to the abundance of emotions that one might feel during times of suffering. If you believe God exists and is in control of your suffering, do you know what will happen to your prayer life? It'll become much more colorful, biblical, and realistic, all at the same time. Colorful, biblical, and realistic, all at the same time, like Job's prayer here. In your prayer, you'll accept the fact that sometimes uh, your praises may be filled with a bit of anxiety. Sometimes when you pray, you might find that your prayers of thanksgiving is going to be mixed with longings for future hopes that you have not yet attained. And sometimes when you confess your worries and anxieties to God, it may be garnished with sprinkles of hope. It's colorful, it's realistic, it's holistic. So here's a conclusion. The one who suffers well, like Job did here, one, prays more, goes to God, and two, they will find their prayers to be less like an organized presentation and more like a colorful painting. Because they're offering to God not just parts of them, but all of them. That's how we suffer well. Are we doing that? In this hard season that we're currently in, how is your prayer life? Are you suffering well? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, you know, we should pray more frequently and more holistically and more colorfully, more biblically, just because... We want to suffer well, you know, as if, you know, this COVID season is, is some kind of test and, and you want to pass it, you know, you want to suffer well, you want to prove to God that you have it in you to pass the test. No, that's not what we're saying. Job isn't praying like this because he wanted to prove himself to God that he can pass a test. He's doing this because his survival depends on it. He lost his kids. His survival depends on it. Perhaps then more so than ever. Friends, go to God in prayer, frequently, colorfully, honestly, holistically, suffer well, 
not to prove him you can do it, but because your well-being depends on it, perhaps more so now than ever. Are you doing that? There's one more thing I think we have to believe in order to do that well. Because I'm not doing that well, and if you are, then good on you, but I, I think many of us aren't. And I think it's because there's one more thing. If we want to holistically, frequently be drawn to God in prayer, we have to know not just that he exists, not just that he is constant, but that he loves you more than you love yourself, even in times of suffering. And Job knew that, which brings us to our last point. Job knew God loved him more than he loved himself. Look at what Job said at the end of verse 21. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, this is interesting. Job was blessing God. That, that means he was thanking God. But this is what's interesting. What did Job thank God for? This is the key. He thanked God for giving him things and for taking things away from him. You see that? The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, we often see people thanking God for his gifts, but when was the last time God took something away from us and we said, oh my, thank you for doing that. You know, it's like me taking away TV time from my daughter and her saying, oh my, thank you, daddy. Thank you for taking that away. I do see now how this habit of being addicted to TV is not good for my growth. I'm really thankful you took it away. You are in the right. What child does that? Who, who does that to God? The second God takes something away, the, our default is just, is just to thank him. I get it. We don't naturally just want to do that. But if we want to get through times of suffering well, if we want to be drawn to him in prayer, frequently, holistically, we got to get to that point. We got to get to the point where we somehow believe what Job believed, that God is allowing this to happen. God's taking away because somehow he loves you more than you even love yourself. And we hear that and we say, but how? How does my heart get there? When he doesn't let me peek behind the curtains, how can I believe that he's taking this away because he loves me? Like you said, right? Heaven's curtains are closed. We can't peek in. And every time I go to him in prayer, it's returned with a loud sil silence. How can I believe that all of these things are true if I'm never given preview to what goes on behind the curtains? I can't give you information of what's going on behind the curtains, but I can give you something better. You're right. Like Job, we who are on earth, we're unable to peek behind the curtains of heaven. We can't go in. But you must remember what the Bible says that God himself came out. We see in our passage today that heaven and earth never meets totally estranged from one another, but you see, you read the rest of the Bible, and there's a time when heaven and earth meets, not in a place, but in a person, Jesus Christ. Who does the Bible claim Jesus to be? God coming down to us on earth from behind the curtains of heaven, and what happened to him when he came out of behind those curtains to us? He went exactly through what Job went through. He became helpless, naked, broke, but he had it even worse. He eventually died on a cross. Why? So that sinners like us may one day enter into behind the curtains to be his forever. And to fully, one day, understand the inner workings of all that's happened there and praise him for all that he's given and all that he's taken away. I don't know what happens behind those curtains, but I can tell you the one who came out. How do we know God loves you more than you love yourself? Because through um, all of our sufferings, Though he may never open up those curtains to show you everything going on there, he did open up those curtains to come and pursue you. We were given life as his was taken away. 
so that we now have the ability to say the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. I don't know always why, but blessed be the Lord. He loves you even in your suffering and even through his own sufferings. So go to him frequently with all the complexities you're experiencing at this time. He's proven that he's worthy of it. Has he not? He's shown you that on the cross. Is this not what you believe, Christian? Is this not what you've always believed? Look, it's not like you're making up this worldview just to get through this COVID season better. You've always believed in this before any of your sufferings happened. So draw deeply from this worldview and live it out. You need it. You need him more now than ever. Pray by yourselves frequently. Pray with your families frequently, colorfully, biblically, holistically, realistically. Look at the cross and find him calling to you in the midst of your suffering as you ponder upon the sufferings he went through to find you. Look at the cross and find him to be a safe place. Find him to be worthy of all of you. Let's pray. Father, a mixture of emotions we're experiencing now, and forgive us for feeling like we can only offer parts of it to you, and forgive us for neglecting meeting with you in this time. In fact, we must learn to forgive ourselves for doing that because really we're not robbing you of anything. You are perfectly sufficient in yourself. What we've been doing as we lack prayer is that we're robbing ourselves from communing with the one who came out of those curtains to suffer for us and die for us so that we may live. We're robbing ourselves of communion with the one who can give us peace and assure us and remind us of how he has used the greatest sufferings to bless us. We're robbing ourselves from the eternal perspective that the Bible gives us. We're robbing ourselves from the worldview we have to eat from and take from. And yet, Father, we've forgotten you. Forgive us and help us now see the urgency of prayer, especially in times like this. Let us now go to you like Job did, frequently, biblically, holistically, and that we may in you find peace and comfort, though mixed with anxiety and worry still, sure, but let us still bring all of that to you, for you are not a high priest who cannot um, empathize with our weakness, but you hear all of our prayers and you accept it still through the blood of Christ. Thank you, Father, for this eternal truth. Thank you, Father, for the cross of Christ, who in now we can have assurance of future deliverance, and we can know you are worthy for us to bring all of us to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.